top of the time, tea time, yeah. this is tea time, yeah. make a difference, one cup at a time, tea time, so be sure to grab your tea, grab a seat, and tune in to Miss Liz, tea time, tea time, Making a difference, one cup at a time. Well, welcome to Tea Time Notes, right? Miss Liz is back. And yes, I still have a little rough voice from last week. I'm still getting over a little cold. And a wedding. My daughter got married on Saturday. So uh, it was a long weekend for Miss Liz. Lots of running around, lots of talking, lots of speaking. So my voice is still a little crackled. But before we get started, we're going to get everybody over to Miss Liz's YouTube channel, Miss Liz's Tea Times with an S check and subscribe ring that little doorbell and you'll be notified when all these tea times are live or when a new episode goes up you can watch all these tea times at any time morning afternoon evening in your car in your home at a picnic at an event whenever you feel that you need to pick her up or check out miss liz's tea times because i have over 300 plus tea time interviews with guests from around the globe with all walks of life and all different topics because we do not serve a beverage in this house we serve tea with storytelling and words so today i have the incredible Riza august here and i am excited to have her here yes we had a little bit of hiccups this morning we had and she had some personal things and we thought we might have had to reschedule it but things have worked out and she is here so we are continuing on with our tea time this afternoon so let's get the disclaimer going and the uh, a bio on Riza and then we're going to get Riza in here and today's tea is thriving expansion and audacity audacity in a good way not in a bad way so we're going to get that out there uh so again the disclaimer for Miss Liz's Tea Time Live show. Miss Liz, myself, is going live using StreamYard. Before leaving a comment, please grant StreamYard permission to see your name at StreamYard.com. Please be advised that the content brought forward for any Tea Time show hosted by myself, Miss Liz, is always brought forward in good faith. However, may bring forward dialogues and opinions that are not representative of my platform. The facts and information are perceived to be accurate at the given time of airing. All tea time guests and audience participants are responsible for using their good judgment and taking any action that may relate to the discussion. The content brought forward may include discussions for some where they may be emotionally at risk. It is significant to know that the show is engaging in discussion forums only to offer and inspire awareness and connection and is not providing therapeutical advice. If you have any questions about the disclaimer or the panel's discussion, you may freely contact me, Ms. Liz, through my email at bookingmissliz at gmail.com. Moving forward, should you choose to voluntarily participate in today's show in any aspect, I myself, Miss Liz, welcomes you. And should you decide that the show is not made for you at this time, I respect those wishes and we'll see you at a later show at a later date and time. And again, regular days for tea time is a Thursday, 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you see a tea time on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, it's a rescheduled surprise or a special tea time that has popped up on Miss Liz's mailing list. So now a little bit about my guests. Well, let me give you a little bit about my guests. Riza August is an award-winning author, speaker, a gel stall practitioner, and a patient's advocate. Riza August has been living with a pulmonary tumor and rare disease for over a decade. Riza shares her insights and perspectives on stage, offering words of inspiration to audiences. Additionally, Riza works one-on-one -on -one with clients, guiding them through the many roadblocks of life and towards living more fully inspired. A girl with sparkles in her hair and once an Ironman athlete, Riza still has a passion for her bike and barbells with her genuine curiosity and love for trying new and old things. You may find Riza taking Bollywood or hip hop dance lessons, trying a silk ulcerous, I'm not sure I'm saying that right, I'll get her to say it, or a boxing class, going indoor skydiving and guiding inspirational workshops and creativity. Through her personal transformation, Riza has learned and practiced removing limited beliefs, shifting her perspectives and embracing an expansive, expansive life. A, a life unleash. Let me get Riza in here. Let's spill some tea together. Welcome, Riza. Hi, thank you so much for having me, Miss Liz. 
it is an honor to have you here. I, I've read a little bit about your book and all of the journeys. So we're going to talk about a couple of journeys today because I went and I did my homework and I found a couple other things you did besides your bike ride from Canada to Mexico. You've also done a couple of other journeys that we're going to talk about today. So Risa, let's get started with who you were as a little girl and who you are now. Hmm. I was the very shy, quiet little girl. I was very um, obedient, well-behaved, well-mannered, uh, also had to do everything perfect. Uh, I wanted to be seen and acknowledged for how well I did everything. And um, yeah, I feel like I I feel like I had an old, older soul, even as a child. I feel like I always really had a more depthful way of thinking and um, and a, a really strong awareness of the people and environment around me, even at a young age. Um, and I would say some of that still holds true today, although I'm letting go of the perfectionist. I'm letting go of um, just having to be um, obedient and do everything the way everyone else thinks I should do it. And and I'm definitely I've broken away from that shyness. And not that I, I still do get shy at times, but um, but I definitely have learned to use my voice and. Um, and speak out more when it's appropriate. And um, and so, and I think you'll learn about some of that as we continue our conversation. So Risa, you mentioned perfectionist. Where'd you get that from? I think it was, um, I grew up in a fairly dysfunctional household. And uh, I think sometimes as, you know, well, for me, I'll speak for me, but as a child, I felt, okay, if if I do everything perfectly and if I do everything really well and I listen and I'm well-mannered and well-behaved, then then my my parents will love me and, and maybe they won't get divorced and maybe they won't fight anymore. And, you know, even with my siblings, I think if I just try to do everything right and please everyone else and well, be perfect, yeah. then, then perhaps I'll be able to keep the peace and, and receive love. I, I asked that question because a lot of perfectionists come from dysfunctional homes because we do want a perfect home, right? Everything is so dysfunctional that we're just like, how can we make it perfect? What do we need to do to fix it, right? We take that we take that ownership of it's me that's breaking everything. It's me that needs to fix everything, right? Um, and for a lot of my listeners out there, I have a lot of survivors that listen, and and that uh, you know, a lot of us put on that perfection role and take that ownership and say, okay, it's me that has to fix it. If I'm just a good daughter, I'm just a good son. Mom and dad will stop fighting. The home will go normal, right? But it's also a sign that, you know, that there, there is trauma in the home. There is things that need to be fixed and it's not us that needs to fix it. You know, we take on those roles as children and we grow up fast. And that's what I got from your story when I was doing my homework on you, Risa, is just the traveling you've done. It kind of gives you that I, I got control of this. I'm going to do this. It doesn't matter how hard it is. I'm going to fix it. I'm going to get to that, that goal. Right. And you really have inspired me and reach by reaching out to me and saying, you know what, Miss Liz, I'd like to have my story heard. And by me getting to do my research on you, Risa, I, I seen that there was a lot of similarities in our stories, uh, you know, but yours was the journey of the traveling and, traveling how what kind of adventure has that been for you my goodness yes uh, all that very well said and uh you know i think i 
I did take it on even into future relationships of trying to fix if I can just fix everything and make it perfect and good for everyone else. And, and then I'll, I'll, I'll not either the abuse will stop or, or, um, or I'll receive the love I've, you know, been seeking. Yeah. And um, it's interesting you bring up the travel uh, because, you know, as I do my continued evolution of this personal growth, it's, you know, perhaps it's been a form of escapism or like, okay, if I can just accomplish this thing or do this thing, maybe everyone will love me, but also I can avoid the feelings, the healing that needs to happen, all of that. <laughs> yeah. Well, what I got from your, from your three journeys that I found, the first one I found was in 2021. Um, and that was the one from Canada to Mexico. Uh, you know, what I got from that was I got control of this. Nobody has control but me. I know that this is a goal I set for myself and I have to accomplish it. So let's talk about that 2021 journey because you went from Canada to Mexico. Um, and I believe it took you how many days drive here? You did 185, 1,845 miles in 41 days in 12 cyclists with one brain tumor named Bubba. So let's talk about, <laughs> let's talk about that journey. Sure. Yeah. So I rode my bike from the border, the Canadian border to the Mexican border down the Pacific coast. And uh, I went into it thinking it was going to be, I thought I would bounce back from my brain surgery and radiation treatment. And it was going to be my trip. And I was going to prove to the world that nothing's got me down. I can do this and I don't need help and I'll just take care of all of it. And so I hired a van with, um, 12 other cyclists. Um, and it would, tr it transported our gear for us from town to town. And, but I was still determined to, you know, not engage with the other 12 cyclists. I, I was going to do this on my own. I didn't need anyone's help. And, you know, the story ends very differently than it begins, but I won't give away too much. Um, but, um, yeah, I set out on the soul healing journey. I, I had one plan and, and it went, the plan changed. And I think it was really um, a good metaphor for how life goes. I, I mean we can have every intention and every plan and try to control the way we want things to happen. Control is my, like, <laughs> that, that's, that's been the one thing I've been <laughs> trying to do all my life was control myself and control everything around me. And I quickly learned that nothing's in my control. <laughs> yeah. Well, like it, like, like it this morning, that was out of your control. Right. But we, we had that good communication and we went back and forth for a few hours and look, we're here, uh, you know? Uh, and I think that's the best thing in life is when we don't have control, that's when the best moments happen. Uh, you know, the best experiences and that as well. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, the number one thing that I got from the journey from Mexico, Canada to Mexico was, did you just wake up one day and say, I'm going to do this? Or like, was there months of planning? Like, mm. I, I was following brain surgery and six weeks of radiation treatment. I, you know, I went from being an Ironman athlete, so a pretty hardcore, intense athlete. And all of a sudden I'm stuck in these tattered gray sweatpants on the sofa, I could barely get to my mailbox and back. And I felt like I had a choice in that moment. I felt like, okay, this could be my life. And, and to me, that felt like no way to live. It, it, it just felt like death to me. Yeah. I don't mean to sound over dramatic, but that's, that's really in that moment, how it felt. And I said, oh, so I can choose this or I can choose to live. And what does that mean? Well, it means getting out of those tattered gray sweatpants off the couch and walking my butt to that mailbox. And, and that's what I did. I chose to live. And 
And I said, okay, now I need some goals. I need something to live for. And I said, well, I pulled out my bucket list and I was like, I'm going to start checking off all these things off my bucket list. And I've always wanted to ride my bike across the U S and I found this particular bicycle route from Canada to Mexico. And I was like, that's the one. And I just signed up. I signed up that same day that I made that decision to live. And then at that point I was like, okay, I have 14 months to get ready for this ride. So it took 14 months of planning. Yeah. Planning and training, like basically getting myself, starting with getting out of those tattered gray sweatpants to all of a sudden riding, you know, hundred miles, you know, in one day. So, um, so yeah, a lot of, a lot of planning and, <laughs> um, and willpower and strength and digging deep and all of it. <laughs> well, that's the one thing that I wanted to get out there was because my listeners, a lot of my listeners think that, Oh, you wake up one morning, boom, it's done. No, it takes baby steps. It takes that little crawl to the mailbox and then pushing. And I want to live for more. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and, that's what I really found interesting and really inspiring about your story, Riza, is that you took the steps and you didn't give up, you know, and it wasn't just one journey. It was a second and a third journey. And, you know, the journeys just kept coming. Now, on this bucket list, the three journeys that you've done that we're going to talk about today is where they were. Were they all on your bucket list or did they come after you did the Canada, the Mexico? Um, I think the second one you're going to mention was definitely on my bucket list. And the other one was sort of the, the, the last one, what I think you're going to mention, which actually I just completed recently. Um, that one kind of evolved. It was sort of on my bucket list, but it kind of evolved and changed a little bit. But, um, but yes, yes. Um, yeah, the second one was to travel to Peru. Yes. <laughs> so how did Peru, you went from Canada to Mexico, now you're in Peru. How did that come about? Yeah. Well, I just always had, I've always heard amazing things about Machu Picchu and, um, and just how Peru is a magical place. And, and I love to travel. So I've traveled ex extensively throughout my life. I've been extremely fortunate and, um, but my worry about Peru was my body had changed so much. And so even just walking for more, like more than, I don't know, a half a mile can be extremely painful and daunting for me. So I did not know how I was going to trek for eight days up and over, over a 15,000 foot pass and, and then climb up to Machu Picchu. I just, I just didn't know how that I was going to be able to do that physically. But um, again, I, I wanted to live and, and, and living doesn't just mean being happy all the time and things being easy. Sometimes they're hard. Sometimes they hurt. Sometimes they're painful or sad or all of it. And, and so when I took on that, when I made that decision to live, it, it includes all of it. <laughs> and experiencing all of it. And so, um, so I got through it. I got through it with a lot of medicate, like painkillers, <laughs> um, like ibuprofen and, um, and oh my gosh, it was magical and amazing. And I, I'm so grateful I, I did that. It was incredible. I, I like that you said it was hard, you know, because life is hard at times but we can still get through those hard times, right? We can do hard things. Uh, there's a song by Jennifer Neltel, I think from Sugarland. She mm -hmm. says, I do hard things. And when I, when I was reading about your story and that, I was like, that, that's, that song resonates with me. She does hard things, uh, you know, and getting up and just taking that step when you're in pain, like if you're living with chronic pain and living with a tumor and that, you know, just getting up and saying, you know what, today, I might just walk to the bathroom, but I'm going to accomplish this, right? Uh, and that was one thing that I got also when I when I looked, looked at uh, your website, and that is that you're a dream maker, and you believe in 
making dreams happen, right? Making that impact happen, but just taking that first step and taking and going on. Um, your third trip that you did, and you did that in May and June of this year was Spain. And yeah. I was just like, wow, this woman has been all over. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about Spain. Yes. I, um, I always had this. So, you know, following brain surgery and radiation treatment and, um, and I'll just give people a little, our listeners, a little background here. So I, I was diagnosed with a tumor at the base of my brain on the pituitary gland. And, and it's cause of rare disease called acromegaly that breaks down, essentially destroys the body over time. Um, we, I did brain surgery. They couldn't get the entire tumor because some of it's wrapped around my carotid artery. So I went on to have radiation treatment and, um, and so I'm still fighting the battle and trying to find a treatment that works. Um, with that said, um, uh, following surgery, I could no longer, my body could no longer run. I couldn't do Ironman races or triathlons. And, uh, and so, but I could still bike. And so I, I really, um, and biking was always my least favorite thing. And I, but I took it on like, okay, this is going to be my thing now. And so I had these dreams of, um, there's this 2000 mile um, journey across um, Europe. And, and that was, that was on my bucket list. And that's, that's something I always wanted to do. And as the years passed, I, you know, my body's changing and it's not as easy to train for something like that again. And so I found the Camino de Santiago, it's a 500 mile um, pilgrimage across Northern Spain. Most people do it on foot. Uh, there's there's few people that do do it by bike. And I thought, okay, I can't do it on foot, but I'm gonna go by bike. And um, and I can 500 miles felt more attainable to me at this time at this period in my life than than that 2,000 miles that I initially had my um, eyes set on. So. Um, and so, so I, I set out in May to, to <laughs> ride my bike solo this time, not with a group of other riders. And it challenged me in every way imaginable, physically, mentally, and emotionally. I thought I was going to die out there. Um, and, <laughs> and again, you know, people ask me, how was that journey? And I say, you know, it was, it was horrible. Like it actually, it, it was challenging in every way. And I will always say, and I'm so grateful for that experience. Well, that's what I got from your three journeys, right? Whereas they were challenging, they were hard, mm -hmm. but you were grateful for the experience. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, and you, we have a couple questions here that I want to get out to you that are coming in. Uh, uh, we have a question here. How old were you when you were diagnosed with the tumor? Gosh, um, it was in 2018. Um, I have to do some quick math here. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to give ages away, but then we. I know. I'm like, I'm getting, I'm getting out my calculator. <laughs> um, so I was. Um, I was 43 and, uh, and, um, these tumors, that's, that's my mission. I'm trying to save lives. It's, it's yeah. believed that these tumors aren't as rare that they say that they are. And most people get diagnosed around middle age. Um, although I've probably had my tumor for a couple of decades. Um, but the symptoms for some reason around middle age really start to come through and even at middle age, it's they're difficult to diagnose because the symptoms are things like fatigue, joint pain, um, like hot flashes, like, you, you know, it, it's things that you can describe uh, or explain away as something else. And and so oftentimes it just gets overlooked. Yeah. And so I'm I'm out to like, let's get people diagnosed earlier because 
their future could be a very different future than mine if if you if you get a earlier diagnosis and so that's my goal yeah well yeah. i think it's deeply important to get the awareness out there right because i i hadn't heard of that illness at all yeah. so when you came to and shared that i was just like oh what is this you know uh, right. And that's the number one thing that I'd like to do with Tea Time is get that awareness out there, right? Teaching educational awareness that we, there's so many different illnesses and diagnosis and mental health and stuff out there that we don't speak about, that we don't get out there and get it out there. So this is what this platform is for, is to get those stories out there. Uh, Risa, you, you uh, gave your tumor a name, Baba. <laughs> Why that name? Because I kind of think it's pretty cute. Me and yes. Bubba's going for a ride, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it can it? I my life will no longer be easy or smooth, or it, it's just the reality of it. It's not. I'm not trying to be a negative or anything. It's it's my new reality, and and so I thought, okay, I can fight my body. I can resist. I can be angry or upset, and. I decided, no, I, I need to shift my perspective. I need to look at life differently. And so it was actually a mentor of mine that encouraged me to talk nicely to my body, be, you know, be more positive towards myself. And, and she goes, and, and maybe you should even name your tumor. And I was like, you're nuts. That's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but then it's, st I started trying it on. I'd be in the car, maybe going to another medical appointment, you know, cause I, I was having weekly medical appointments and I'd be like, all right, you're really pissing me off or, oh, this is getting annoying or, okay, I have to talk nicer to you. And I just started having conversations with this tumor and I would try on all different kinds of names, but Bubba is the one that stuck. <laughs> I think Bubba is really cute, right? Because it's almost like a buddy. Like, come on, I'm stuck with you. Let's let's learn to build this relationship together, right? It's like that, you know, like maybe a boyfriend or something that you just got to learn to love, right? There's a little tough love or something once in a while. Uh, but I like the name Bubba. I think it's cute. And, you know, and it's, it's a good way to get frustrated as well. Like, you know, Bubba, you're pissing me off. Like, Bubba, like, I'm tired of you. Like, yeah. you know. Um, he was my nemesis in the beginning. And now, you know, I've, I've shifted that around as well. And um, he's now my cheerleader. So, yeah. Well, see, that's what I mean. Like you took a negative and turned it into a positive. And that's exactly what you've done with your life as well with these books. Right. So you mm -hmm. have the one book, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. So yes. how did you get the title of that book? I know that you travel border to border, but. I like that it's really just simple, but it's a nice title. And tell us a little bit about the cover and all of that. Yeah, so uh, so the road unpaved. I, uh, it's a metaphor for our lives. Our lives are like a road. Rarely are they ever smooth and straight. You know, we have those moments in life. Like I've been on my road bike and I've been on a newly fresh paved road and it's so smooth and wonderful. But, but that's rare. Um, there's always twists and turns, um, bumps in the road, potholes. Sometimes the road's not even paved. It's a gravel or washed out, you know, and you have to take detours. And, and so it just really felt like such a metaphor for life for me. And, and so, and then, you know, as a road cyclist, um, I spend a lot of time on the road and and face a lot of those uh, obstacles and um, and then my as far as my cover design goes, it's really colorful and I I ended up being um, I was only supposed to be in the hospital for two days. I ended up being in the intensive care for ten days and you know, there's a specific experience in that book that I talk about that happened when I was in the ICU. And it, it really changed my whole perspective on life. And so life became more colorful for me. It became, I wanted to do everything. I, I really fully wanted to live. Like I wanted to like see the world and, and try this and, tr and try all those 
restaurants I have always said I wanted to try and never did or try take the dance class I always wanted to take or um, do the cool things that I always said I wanted to do. I really I, like it just life became more um, like incredible and precious. And and so when you asked me what my favorite colors co color was, it's all the colors. You know, I just life is meant to be vibrant and full and beautiful and amazing and fun and all the all the words I can think of. <laughs> well, yeah, because when I asked you your favorite color, you said rainbow. And, <laughs> you know, and I was just like, I can see that in the cover, like the rainbow of the bike on how the colors are changing, right? Right down to the gravel. Yeah. Um, and and it is a metaphor of life, right? It is the steps of life. The, the, on top, it gets heavy, then it gets lighter and lighter, and the colors get lighter, right? You start with the dark reds and purples, and then you get down to the nice, soft, calming blues, mm -hmm. uh, you know? Uh, and I could see the rainbow. I could see the, you know, the transformation just in the cover. You don't even have to read the book, guys. You just look at the cover, and you can see that there's a journey among the pages of that book. Um, you know, uh, do you have any plans of writing another book for the other journeys that you've taken? I have already started my second manuscript. Um, yes. Um, at least one of the other journeys will be in, in my next book. I've, I've had a lot of people ask, well, what happened? What happened after that? And, um, you know, we'll see, we'll see. It's, it's this, just this first book has been a lot of work. So um, I, I, I don't know when that next book will get out. Um, and, um, and I'm also thinking, I'm also have some other ideas that are in the works, um, other projects, fun projects that um, I would love to include the world in uh, if they come to fruition or when they come to fruition, I should say. <laughs> Well, what I really like is that you have a bucket list, right? And you're checking the stuff off, uh, you know, sometimes, and it's not overnight bucket lists that gets answered. You know, you put a lot of work and effort into all of these journeys. Uh, we have a question here for when you took the ride in Spain, what, was there a reason why you did the bike ride over walking? Um, yes. Yeah, so physically it's very challenging for me to walk. It's extremely painful. Um, what the disease does is it, it, it changes all the bones and tissues in your body. So they no longer, nothing fits together like it used to. And, and so it just breaks the whole body down over time. And so, so again, hiking, walking, I, cause I used to love mountaineering and backpacking and, and that will no longer be a big part of my life anymore. So, I mean, I get, I get sore just walking around like Costco for, for an hour, you know? So well, that's a concrete wall and floors as well. Cause I get a sore back walking in those doors. I'm just like, can you not put carpet on the floor or something like make it softer for my back. Uh, yeah. You know, so, so, I, but yeah, biking, cycling has less impact on my joints. And so it's a lot easier um, and less painful for me. Well, and, you know, and sometimes riding a bike is a lot easier than walking and it gets you to the place faster too, by riding a bike. Yeah. Sometimes it's easier. Sometimes it's harder. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so on your bucket list, Riza, do you have another journey in motion for the future or are you taking a break from traveling? Like, I definitely don't want to stop traveling. Um, my journeys just might look different. Um, you know, I'm very interested in doing some, they're called bike and boat tours. And, and so you, you hop on a boat, like a river boat or, a, and, and you, you're taken to, for, to each port. Uh, and then you get off and you ride your bike for the day. And then you get back on the boat at the end of the day. Um, if you don't want to ride your bike the next day, you don't have to. And so um, physically, I just, you know, my adventures may look a little different. Um, and and so, you know, but currently I'm actually in the midst of a new adventure, which is it's it's actually unlike any other adventure I have. I just bought a home and um, on my own, which is um, a 
a big deal for me. I've, I've been, I'm usually, I'm used to being a more free spirited and not tied to one place. So this is actually quite the adventure for me. I've, I've already, um, just have experienced a lot of, um, funny or different or challenging situations, um, with being a new home homeowner. So <laughs> I, I, I can see that because you're a traveler, right? So staying in one place, that's got to really be a tough one for you. It is, it is. And, and I, I still do like small weekend adventures and stuff right now, but, and I'm thinking of like renting the place out and, you know, taking off to another country for a few months. So, you know, so I think the exciting thing about my whole shift on my perspective in life is not being tied to one thing. Like it doesn't, you know, okay, so I do have this new home now, but it doesn't mean I'm tied here. I'm not going to put those constraints, those imaginary constraints on myself. Like it doesn't mean I'm stuck. Like yeah. not, you know, I still can go away and, and it just might look different now. And, and so again, it's not limiting ourselves to, well, this is my circumstance now. So I guess this is where I'm stuck. No, no, I don't believe that at all. I like that word stuck because you're just taking it and you're, you're saying, no, we don't need to stay stuck. Like I can rent out my home. I can still travel, you know, yeah. so you have some solutions out there, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that, that that's really encouraging. You know, if we feel stuck in life, you can still travel. You can still get out and do stuff. You can. You might not be able to do it the way you want to, so yeah. you find a different way of coming at it, right? Exactly. Um, There's always another way. Like the like I like. I mean, the Camino in Spain was a perfect example of that. Most people hike it. Most people walk. I couldn't. I could not physically do that. So I did it by bike. There's always another way. Like and yeah. so use that as a metaphor in your life. You know. I like that. There's always another way, guys. So you hear that? There's always another way of doing things. If And I always say, have a plan B, C, D. Like I, everybody's like, oh, I have a plan A. Well, okay, but well, well, the plan A doesn't work. You need to have that B and C and D, right? Uh, especially the, this weekend that just passed, I, I had to have a plan B, C, and D. Like, you know, things just come up and you're just like, that's not the way it's going to be. So you have to be able to adjust to the different things that you can do, right? Yeah. So let's talk about your tea because you gave me three incredible words and you made sure that the audacity was in a good way. <laughs> she had even put that in brackets when she sent it to me. So let's talk about the thriving and expansion, expansive, expansive, I think is what you gave me. Mm -hmm. And then audacity, but in a good way. So let's talk about those three words. Why those three words? Yes. So, you know, we can you know, we, in the world, I can wake up and I can be living, but am I thriving? And what does that mean? Thriving to me feels like I'm not just living. I'm like excelling beyond that. I'm growing like personal growth or, um, I'm, I'm doing what matters. Like I'm connecting. I'm, um, doing good in the world. I'm inspiring. I'm, you know, uh, it, it's all the things that, you know, I think, right. What's coming to mind is like a plant, like, you know, we could have house plants and, and they can be getting by and growing, but man, you stick them in the sunlight and a little extra water and they just blossom and that, and they're thriving. Right. So I, I just put myself in the right conditions so that I thrive. You know, I don't want to just live. I want to thrive. And and so so that's what that word uh, means for me. Um, and then as as far as expansion goes or expansive, I think I put I want to be open to all the possibilities out there in life. And I want to allow myself to expand and grow. I I don't want to. Um, I used to be very. Um, judgmental. And uh, I guess I'll say narrow in my thinking. Like I always thought like, why wouldn't people do, operate the same way I do? Why wouldn't they think the way I think or believe the beliefs I have? Or I was just very rigid um, in the way um, I viewed the world and other people. And, 
And now I've just expanded. Like now I'm just more open. I'm more patient and kind and compassionate and um, understanding. And, and I don't even always have to understand. That's the thing. I don't have to understand it. Like it's sometimes it's okay if I don't, you know, so, um, so expansive just means open to everything and all things like, and yeah, I, I think I'll leave it, leave it there. But, um, and then audacity, audacity to means, means guts, grit. Oh, I like, like that. I yeah. Like, that. <laughs> like I like courage. Like I just have, um, the gumption or the gall to go out. And then I'm just, you know, I tried, you talked about, um, the silks aerialist class I took. So, so if you've been to like Cirque du Soleil or like you see the aerialists up in the air on the, like the long ribbons that hang down, or sometimes they're on other, other contraptions, but but I was just like, that's always something that like, it looks amazing. I'm going to try it. So, so like, I don't know, I, I'm not as graceful as I used to be. And, and, but you know what? I have the guts to try it anyways. So, um, again, I don't want to limit myself. So, so to me, that's, that's what audacity means. I, I, re I really like that Riza, because I say it all the time. If we don't try it, then we live with regret, right? Yeah. I'd rather live with trying and failing and falling and okay. saying, okay, well, that's not my cup of tea. I won't do that ever again, you know, <laughs> break, break well, arms so and I'll be like, oh, okay, well, that'll <laughs> heal. But, you know, but if you don't try, you will never know. And that's what I got from your three journeys is if I didn't try, I would never know. Mm -hmm. I would always live with that. Well, woulda, coulda, shoulda, you know, but you can say I did it. And was it hard? Oh my goodness. Yeah, it was hard, but yeah. I did it, you know? Uh, and, and I think that that's really inspiring for the listeners and, you know, to understand that if we tr try, sometimes it's going to be hard. Riza has shared that it was hard. It, we, she didn't think she would make it, but she did. And she's mm -hmm. here to share the story of it. So, uh, you know, uh, I want to get into these sparkly lockets, uh, <laughs> I was just like, wow, from bike riding journals, traveling to these sparkles. Um, I, what do I have here? I have the Lucky Locks hair sparkles. Mm -hmm. And I believe you're wearing sparkles in your hair today. I do. Yes. So <laughs> tell us a little bit about that. So from riding to sparkles. Yes. So again, you know, my whole shift in perspective on life and and how vibrant life really can be and i was walking around um a local artist market um in oregon and i saw this gal putting these beautiful so their silk sparkles in in people's hair mainly um older women but there were some children and and everyone's getting sparkled and um i was like that looks so fun like people were beaming they 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 were just beaming with their sparkles and so i i stood in line and i got my hair sparkled and then i was beaming i was just I, like i don't really color my hair i barely you know some days i barely even brush it but i i just was like i just felt like i was glowing from the inside out and just from a few of these sparkly strands in my hair and and then all of a sudden other people were like i oh, what is in your hair i love those oh i want them and 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 then they were smiling because they, they just thought it was so cool and i was like wow these like tiny mighty little strands are bringing so much joy to people the people who have them and the people who get to see them. Yeah. And I was like, I want to do that. I want to, and it, I want to bring joy to other people. And so I talked with the gal who was doing this and she, her company's luckylocks.co um, and a little shout out there, but she, she franchises mobile partners. She calls them mobile partners and I got set up with her and now I do it. And I, I was actually featured in Women's World Magazine for it. 
And, um, and uh, my gosh, it, I, people, I go to conferences, like it's, it's seriously like, do me, do me. I want the sparkles. <laughs> like, it's just like, and, and it, it fills me like it, tr it just fills me. And I, I mean, I will do it till I, I can barely stand anymore because I just, I love it so much. I love how happy it makes people. And so, and so that's really the driving force behind that <laughs> the little side gig. <laughs> well, a little sparkle goes a long way, right? And yes. it, it's, it's the little things that make life uh, magical. I find, okay. you know, keep that little child play in you, you know, bring that little girl out, like all, all girls and even guys like sparkles <laughs> once in a while. Yeah. Uh, I've done some men's beards before. And oh, well, yeah. look at that. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm going to take you in a different journey and that's what we're doing. We're just doing different journeys today with Riza. I want to talk about, um, what do I have here? Touchedbyahorse.com. I want to talk about that a bit. So what is touchedbyahorse.com? So touch by horse is actually my current employer. Like, so that's my, so I have my business as a, as a coach, which is feather and sage coaching. And then I, I work for touch by horse. I run, I actually run the operations, um, for touch by horse. And, um, I work for a woman who, um, I've been working with her for 13 years now. We're actually, we call each other family. Um, but she started a company that partners, um, that takes the modality of Gestalt, um, which is a healing modality or like a therapeutic um, approach to healing. And she partners with horses. And what she did, she started noticing that horses really are tuned into people's energies. Um, and uh, they are extremely... Um, yeah, it's hard to describe in words. And I think anyone who would tell you about equine gestalt uh, coaching would have a hard time putting it into words. But horses are very in tune to energy. Yeah. And um, and so my boss, who I work for, she went on to... Um, she noticed the connection between the horses and the humans and the energy. And she went on to create this incredible um, healing um, modality around it and created the company called touch by a horse and, um, and people go on to become certified practitioners um, through her um, programs. And, um, and they go on to, coach people through um, their own healing journeys. So truly incredible, incredible work. I've, I've seen it. I've seen it change people's lives. Like I've seen it. I can't explain it, but I've seen it. I've experienced it and I've seen it just it completely change people's lives. For the I, I, I've seen it myself with horses and energy and that and they're used a lot with trauma and abuse. Yeah, because to build the build that uh, trust again, right? So you mm -hmm. have to trust the horse. The horse has to trust you. So a lot of deep healing, deep energy is worked with horses. And when I seen that, I was like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> so now we're gonna switch it up, and we're gonna go to the feather and sage. So mm -hmm. where does feather and sage come in? Yeah. So I I actually um, went ahead and got uh, certified um, as a Gestalt practitioner myself because I saw how the work healed me and how it was healing other people. And so I branched off and started my own um, coaching practice, um, which I call Feather and Sage Coaching. And, uh, and so I work with clients one-on-one uh, -on -one and to help them through their own personal healing journeys. So, so Riza, you've really done a lot of journey, a lot of different journeys, right? Bike riding, walking, Iron Man, Iron Man, uh, you know, uh, dancing. Uh, do you still dance today? I yes, I still. I think I just recently took um, some West Coast swing <laughs> oh. dance classes. So <laughs> yeah, so um, I'm always trying. Yeah, something new for sure. <laughs> 
So, Enrisa, you also do speaking as well, correct? Yes, correct. So yeah. when you're speaking on the stage, what is your main topic? Yes, it's typically around mindset and limited, limiting beliefs. Yep. And so I just did a talk for um, women over the age of 40 and um, how women over the age of 40 are perceived in the world and how I'm like, oh, no, no, no. We're not going to limit ourselves and we're, we're unstoppable. Like, <laughs> yeah, we and, just heard nature. We're like, no, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> well, we get to, let me rephrase that. We get to do it our way now, you know, yeah. like not, not what everyone else uh, expects of us or um, thinks we should do. But, uh, and so I just did a, a wonderful talk this past weekend um, around not limiting ourselves and, um, and living life on our terms. So, so yeah, it's, it's typically around mindset. Yeah. So Risa, I want to I get into your favorite word in your, that you gave me to describe yourself and it's resilient. Why resilient? I believe like over the past six or seven years, actually it probably goes beyond. No, I'm going to say for my majority of my life, I've got knocked down quite a bit, blindsided, sideswiped, you name it. And I just, I keep getting back up. I keep getting back up and I'm like, all right, I'm going to try again. And I might have to pivot or <laughs> try something different, try it a different way. But what's most important is that I'm getting back up and I'm showing up. And I'm doing it anyways, despite all the crap, all the struggles and challenges. I'm going to do it anyways. And, you know, man, I've had some really sweet, incredible, amazing moments because of that. So, so again, yeah, I'm going to do it anyway. So I like that. I'm going to do it anyway. I like that <laughs> attitude. I'm going to get back up. You're not leaving me down there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I want to get into... Um, you also do coaching. It's called creative coaching. So what is creative coaching? Yeah. So it's, again, I, I'm, I use a lot of the gestalt modality, but I also, you know, if you know about, which I'm sure you know about coaching, it's, it's really a lot of how you infuse your own style and approach. And because I do have some other certifications um, in like, human dynamics and relationship dynamics and things like that. So, and I'm also very, um, the way my mind works um, is a lot, there's some solution based stuff as well. Like, you know, I, I, I believe we all have the answers within us, but sometimes we need a little help or guidance or suggestions. And so, you know, I know I appreciate that when I am working with a coach or therapist is like, okay, I know I have the, the ability within me, but I need some help here. Yeah. So, so I, that's why I coined the term creative coaching, because sometimes it's going to take a little bit of this. Sometimes it's going to take a little bit of that. You know, we might have to infuse some other things. And so, you know, I really like that the fluidity of that, the flexibility of that. Like sometimes we just have to go with the flow with what's in the moment. And that might mean getting creative. So, um, and so that's, that's where that, that's where that comes from. I love it. You know, yeah. we got to get that creative side out there and really just get out there. Uh, you also have living unleash. What is living unleash? Yeah. So this comes from, um, I was actually sitting in a therapy session and this was when I was going through a major, my major transformation following brain surgery, like everything, like everything seemed to be changing in my life. It's like, it just felt like this huge upheaval. And I remember in this therapy session, grabbing my chest saying, I just want to unleash. There's like all this within me and I just want to unleash and I'm afraid that the world or the people in my life won't accept it. And 
And I, I remember talking to my friend, dear, dear friend and mentor. I call her wide old, I call her wise old sage. She's, um, she's, she's just such a grounding place for me. And she said, huh, Rissa unleashed. I wonder what she's like. And then it just took off from there and it became my handle and it became the way I was going to live life. I wasn't going to let live by anyone else's constraints or, or my own self-imposed constraints anymore. I was going to live life unleashed. So, so I want to ask you about the MBCT, the mindfulness based cog cognitive therapy. What is that? Yes. Um, well, when I was in the midst of my healing and, you know, kind of um, house um, contained to my home through my healing and I, I needed something to keep me going. And so I took up painting. I don't consider myself an artist, but I took up painting and I started realizing I was so focused on the painting. It, it took me like, I was so like, it took me away from focusing on what I, what my body couldn't do anymore or the, the pain I was facing or, and it, it was really a mindfulness practice. And I was like, wow, I need to infuse this more in my life. And so I got a, I got my certificate in guiding others through mindfulness practice. And um, it really gets us out of our own, our own, you know, negative thinking and focus and, and I, and, and you know what the interesting thing that came out of that, I, my paint, my art pieces went on, I sell them worldwide now. <laughs> I'm not even in, I'd, I'd never considered myself an artist, but like, but that's what became from that mindfulness practice were these beautiful pieces that helped me through some really hard healing uh, times in my time in my life. So. Well, I think it was right back to the limiting beliefs, right? Yeah, you were yeah. like, Oh, my goodness, I can't do this. What is this? Like, who's gonna buy this? Like, you know, we right. overthink so much in life. And we make it so complicated sometimes when it's so simple. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's almost like the mind kind of triggers us right and says, think negative, think negative, where we have to push ourselves to think positive, you know, especially in hard situations. And especially when you're living with something that is changing your life and changing the daily routine and that and you have to come to acceptance acceptance is a huge thing you know yeah. living with living with the brain tumor you know because you have to say okay i can't do that anymore but i can still do this yeah. you know um and i and that's what i got from your story Risa, is that you know i can't do this but i can still do this you know I still got the guts to try, you yeah. know, they're, they're telling me I can't let me try. Let me <laughs> see if I can, you know? Um, so what final message would you have for everybody today? Yes. Don't, don't let anyone limit you. Don't let anyone else tell you what you can or can or should or shouldn't do. You get to determine that you get to decide that. And it might not go exactly according to plan or the way you want to do it, but you get to still make that decision to, to try. Yeah. So, so Risa, if anybody wanted to reach out to you to have them on their podcast or speak at an event or anything, how could they reach you? Hmm, I would say the best way would be to go to my website, rissaaugust.com. And it's Rissa with one S R I S A august.com. And you can um, fill out the contact form or my email is also on my website and you can email me directly and I would love to connect. And do you have any upcoming events that you'd like to get out? Oh, gosh, I have um, I have a couple author events in uh, in the Denver area coming up. And uh, I, I also post a lot of my most of my podcast interviews on my website as well. And, and I do have, um, I do list speaking events and things on my website as well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me on Tea Time. It was a pleasure having you here. Uh, thank you to the listeners and audience who have sent questions in and sharing your support, saying that you're watching. 
I truly appreciate that as well. Uh, if you guys would like to know more about Tea Time, you can check out Miss Liz's website at www.misslizesteatime. I will be back tonight at 7 p.m. with a second guest. And tonight we're going to be talking about horror stories. Uh, and the story of Joel Mc McKay will be joining me. And his story is called It Came From The Trees. So we'll be talking about that. And he's also a biker. So we're going to continue the journey with bikes Uh like I said, Miss Liz, every week my two guests align in some ways. So until then, I will see everybody same time, same place. And we're going to serve a different type of tea and keep sharing your stories and your words. And we'll make a difference one cup of tea at a time. Thank you.